for nice to meet um, Today we have uh, Maria Gero Lemo um, with a uh, fellow talk. So um, we'll just uh, pass it over to you, uh, Maria. Your talk is uh, Missingness and Recognition in Classical Antiquity. So, yes. Thank you. So thank you, Mark. And good morning and happy new month. So, but uh, yeah, uh, missingness and recognition. Um, before I start discussing this specific topic, I mean the relationship between missingness and recognition, I think uh, it would be a good idea to say a few words um, in general about uh, this uh, new project of mine on missing persons in antiquity. Now, the project attempts to shed light on how the condition of a person gone missing, that is of a person who left and is presumed missing is conceptualized in the Greco-Roman world. The project consists of three parts that outline the conditions of a psychological, sociological, and scientific encounter with the concept of missingness uh, in antiquity. The threads which hold the broad um, range of different aspects of the project together are the notions of absence, presence, and uh, the physical body as a tangible entity with its own unique properties. By using trauma theories, the first part attempts to define uh, missingness as physical absence informed by the lack of information on the person uh, gone missing and as a condition that is experienced and described by the left behind. The second part discusses lostness and displacement with a view to describing how a, um, a person who is classified um, uh, as missing uh, as missing experience their inability to find their way back um to, uh, to 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 find their way back or even to communicate um their uh, whereabouts the third part of this work articulates the significance um, of missingness and lostness discussed discussing part one and two vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the notion of recognition and body identification. Now, missingness is a difficult phenomenon to define both in antiquity, but in the contemporary world as well. Missingness is an ambiguous condition that is experienced, as I said, by the left behind when they deal with the physical absence of their loved ones. And it includes both the lack of information about their, um, 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 their whereabouts and the fruitless efforts of the family to trace them. Hence, missing persons are individuals of whom their families and friends have no news based on reliable information. Greeks and Romans, although they think about different sorts of missing uh, people in quite different ways, tend to treat, for instance, someone lost at sea, someone disappeared, a soldier whose body was never recovered, and someone who simply walked out of the house and never returned, as being essentially the same, that is, an, as an absent upon body. The modern idea of missingness, on the other hand, um, relates to the fact that modern societies have far more extensive systems of record keeping and surveillance and much quicker and more comprehensive commu communication technologies. So that it's harder to go missing and hence it is more surprising or dramatic when someone does. To put it differently, in our era, missingness has also a political dimension. It's not only about absence and its social uh, consequences. Moreover, our era associates a missing person status, at least in legal terms, primarily with a, a specific period of time. For instance, the German law distinguishes between missing people whose fate is unknown for a long time, and they are called Verschollen, and missing for Mr. Person, who, for Mr. Persons whose fate is unknown for a shorter period of time. These for Mr. Persons, they're eventually declared as Verschollen if the police have searched for them for at least a year and have not found any sign of life or confirmed their death. Their death. 
Now in the UK, the court appoints a guardian to manage a missing person's property after 90 days of their uh, disappearance. So it's all about time. In antiquity, on the other hand, people probably went missing all the time since communication technologies, travel and duration of travel were subject to many difficulties such as violence or the, um, uh, the, the scarcity of well-maintained maintained roads, weather conditions, etc. For these reasons, it is generally difficult to know when a person is considered missing, especially when it comes to travelers or soldiers who are, who, who are constantly away from home. And it's probably because, uh, uh, probably uh, for this reason as well, that ancient legal texts that um, uh, talk about inheritances and, and laws about inheritances or inheritances rights or the right of the missing person's wife to remarry, they are quite vague uh, about the legal status of uh, missing persons. So it's not about time and antiquity, it's about space. Space plays a much more important role for the ancient concept of missingness. Ancient stories of missing persons appear to develop within two different spaces. The first represent, uh, represents the space where the missing person used to live and where their relatives and friends still reside. The second refers to the space where the missing person finds themselves while trying to return home. The real, the physical space, which is often described in ancient texts through the uh, term oikumeni, the inhabited world, um, um, recedes in this case into the background and it is being replaced by an imaginary and almost dystopian uh, space where missing a person's experience, what we could call lostness. Um, um, so it's it's very important to to ask um, in this um, uh, occasion what does it mean to be lost somewhere in the Eschadia? What what what, what does it mean to be trapped for Odysseus in Circe's um, uh, palace? How is how is one's sense of home affected by the experience um, uh, of becoming lost? Persephone, for instance, in the Homeric hymn to Demeter, hopes for rescue until the point she could not see the earth, the sky, and the sea, since the underworld affects the way she feels, and conversely, the way she, uh, she, she feels affects the way she experiences this particular space, and no space, it's, it's, it's nowhere. The underworld is, the underworld is unmapped. Now, people in antiquity go missing both deliberately and involuntarily. Since I define missingness both through the perspective of the left behind and as lostness experienced uh, by the missing persons themselves, I go, I go beyond cases of enforced uh, disappearance and include every case of absence that forces the families of missing persons to suffer, no matter the reasons or circumstances of their disappearance. In this context, I discuss cases of persons who are described as missing by others, but in reality, they disappear by choice. Herodotus cites a, part cites a particularly telling example, and this is the first passage um, on the handout. Uh, he tells us about this uh, uh, Pythagorean, Zalmoxis, uh, who disappeared. He vanished into the air, Ephaneste, in front of the Thracian's eyes, and departed for a land of immortality. Or according to Herodotus, he just hid in an underground residence that he himself had previously dug. His family misses him though, a pothum, and mourns him as if, as if he is dead. But his disappearance or missingness here is a chosen status. People who go missing involuntarily form a second category of missing persons. This category refers to people who are taken away by force or are, or are uh, lost and are facing, uh, facing difficulties in finding their way back home. For instance, Odysseus and other tragic heroes go missing on their return home. Missing children and women, on the other hand, for example, in comedy and the novel, are often victims, uh, victims uh, of abductions. Persephone's, stories, uh, uh, Persephone's story, as narrated in the Homeric hymn to Demeter, forms a typical case. Although the missingness in her story 
is an expression of a rite passage. It describes Persephone's transition into uh, womanhood. It also reflects both uh, Demeter's, her mother's, and Persephone's um, inner condition, their anguish, helplessness, and frustration. This second category of missing persons also includes those who go missing because of an illness, specifically madness. Famously, Helen in sub for fragment 16 is described as abandoning her loved ones when the goddess Aphrodite, Aphrodite seduced her wits and left her to wander, made her to forget everyone and everything and thus to lose um, her way. The narrator explains here how Helen's uh, sad uh, missingness is reminiscent of an actoria's um, um, absent, the narrator's beloved. Now, in general, Greek uh, lyric poets are susceptible to absent things and people, which might be uh, reflective of their uh, capacity, of their ability for uh, um, a creative detachment from present uh, circumstance, circumstances. As missingness um, is used um, here in the in, in Sappho uh, and in lyric poetry in general as a narrative trope, which literally brings back a person through song on a certain occasion. Now, being present and at the same time physically absent is also used in the Odyssey to keep Odysseus present throughout the epos. Making absence present through narrative instills remembrance, and when the right time comes, it supports recognition. During this process, the past of a missing person is transferred into the present through the employment of specific bodily signs and generally tokens that reconstruct or can reconstruct the missing person's identity. Identification of a person is used to individualize and thus to link a person to a known identity. The most frequently used and simplest method of identification is personal recognition by relatives and friends. In our era, further methods have been deployed, developed, and are employed for the identification of persons in general. Those include fingerprints, DNA profiling, retina scans, facial features, voice patterns, but also other evidence based, for instance, on clothing and personal belongings. Recognition stories in antiquity include as well various, include as well various insignia, signs. More precisely, and so, so, as I have already revealed in the abstract of this talk, recognizing a person in antiquity, and specifically when one declared missing, is a process that occurs in two steps. The first step refers to the identification of the person through their unique bodily features and or further signs, which will refer to pieces of clothing, jewelry, um, uh, letters, etc. The second step is um, to be able to verify the identity of the person missing and enable their reintegration um, uh, into the family and community. This um, last step requires, in addition, the ability to retrieve related information from memory. Now, there seems to be a difference between recognizing in general a person of whom you just heard of and recognizing someone who is already very familiar to you. In book three and four of the Odyssey, for instance, Nestor and afterwards Helen and Menelaus, and this is passage number two uh, on your handout, recognize Telemachus because he is so like the father, Odysseus, in looks, speech, and motions. And um, um, uh, on, on, although they have never seen this, uh, the sun before. So even if they, uh, they haven't seen the sun before, they recognize him because, because he looks like Odysseus in face, speech, and motions. By contrast, natural and artificial signs are employed as mnemonic devices only in cases of recognition of close friends and family members. This second type of recognition, however, involves not just a matching of the signs to a store representation of a familiar figure, but also a certain access to experience-based information. It thus functions as a bridge that unites the missing person's actual return 
with the previous efforts of the left behind to represent um, um, uh, their absence as the former, the missing persons, have been physically absent, but, but psychologically present for their families. Unlike the modern concept of identification, which in our society rests upon features inherent in the body itself, and most of the cases accessible only through technology, in antiquity, external bodily features, such as body form, footprints, voice, or pieces of hair, although they do facilitate, uh, facilitate linking a person's physical features with an identity, when they do not trigger a memory, um, when they do not evoke memories, they do not always guarantee recognition. Uh, the anagnosis seen in Euripides Electra, for instance, teach us exactly this. Separated from her missing brother, Orestes by birth, Electra admits that she will not be able to recognize him ever if, uh, even if she saw him, and states that only the old man, the pedagogos, will be able to uh, recognize Orestes in this passage number three uh, on the handout. In addition, uh, the tokens of anagnosis, that is the hair and footprint used successfully by Electra in Aeschylus Ecroiphoroi to identify um, her brother Orestes, fail here to serve their purpose. Many unrelated people have the same hair color, Electra says, and male and female hair are distinct. The one is the look of a nobleman grown in the palestra, the other is feminine and soft by means of combing. Also, when the old man compares the footprint, footprint to hairs, Electra implies that the stony ground around the tomb could not hold an impression and that men have larger feet than women. She can even recognize the cloth she wove as a, as a girl and left by her brother as an offering on the tomb of their father. And she argues that even if she, if she had been old enough to wave the garments, Orestes will not be able to wear them today unless the clothes had grown along with his body. So it's just the scar. It's the scar on the face of Orestes who helps the pedagogos to recognize him immediately and accept the fact that he has come back and eventually persuade, uh, to persuade Electra that this is in fact the case. But again, the scar in this play by comparing Orestes to a heroic exemplar, which is Odysseus, it simultaneously denies Orestes the possibility of living up to the claims implied for him. The scar is being employed in the place of a character, of a, in the place of a stamp on coins and seals, which could be used as a proof of character. This is what Orestes asked some lines before, asked for some lines before in the text, and this is the next passage in your handout. But he himself, although he has a marker, he has the scar, will prove a false coin certainly not one that his philoi can cash in to buy their safety. Hence, uh, external bodily features cannot always be a reliable source of information and consequently support recognition of identity, also because of all the biological changes in human uh, body goes through time. Physical indicators of identity, such as the scar of Odysseus, must be checked against first person memories in order to be 100% valid. If someone has a scar just like Odysseus, Euryclea may conclude that he is him. But even if she's right to do so, having seen his scar, his scar is not sufficient evidence that proves his identity. Porphyry, a Neoplatonist philosopher of the third century uh, CE, in his Homeric Questions on the Odyssey, reports Aristotle, um, described Aristotle as challenging Euryclea's recognition of Odysseus through his scar as based on faulty reasoning. Anyone with a scar is Odysseus, supposedly asked Aristotle. Aristotle. Now, as we learn from Eric Auerbach's book on my missus, 
in Homer, there is no antagonism between sensory appearance and meaning. The basic impulse of Homeric style, um, he says, is to represent phenomena in a fully external, externalized form, visible and palpable in all their parts. That means physical proof in Homer is always accompanied by meaning. So what matters more in the analysis scene with Euryclea in book 19 of the Odyssey, and this is the next passage, passage number five from the handout, is how the scar is accompanied by the story of Odysseus for forehand with his grandfather, Autolycus, who has the same story tell us, is the one who actually uh, names Odysseus. In this context, not only his scar, his voice, phone, uh, his Demas body, and feet, and uh, as Penelope implies earlier in the text, his age, but most importantly, the memory that these signs evoke assist the anagnorismos, the, rec the recognition of Odysseus. Through the scar, Odysseus is being further identified by the swineherd, Eumaeus, and cowherd, and uh, Philosios. Here, the scar should be enough evidence to convince the two loyal servants to help their lord. But when Odysseus displays finally the scar to his father Laertes, this is once again accompanied, this sign is once again accompanied by a description of the journey to his grand, uh, grandfather's house in order to explain how he received his wound. The scar is also followed by an additional sign or story. Odysseus recalls in detail uh, the types and quantities of the trees and the vines that his father gave to him. Signs in general, and the scar in particular, cannot always support on their own the recognition of a specific identity. Fourth century Athenians were indeed experiencing how orators were manipulating at course a variety of visual features, including facial expressions, physical fitness and clothing as indicative of either the permanent nature of a man or of his criminal um, uh, record and behavior. For instance, in his against um, uh, uh, Timarchus, Aeschines accuses a Timarchus of being unfit to involve himself in public life by using um, a, phys a physiognomical argument. And this is uh, the passage number six on your handout. He says, and I will just read the translation. See now, fellow citizens, how unlike to Timarchus were Solon those men of old, whom I mentioned a, mo a moment ago. They were too modest to speak with the arm outside the clock. But this man, not long ago, yes, only the other day, in an assembly of the people, he threw off his cloak and leaped about like a gymnast, half naked. His body so reduced and befouled through drunkenness and lewdness that right-minded men, at least they cover their eyes, being ashamed for the city that we should let such men as he be our advisors. Various bodily markers and other signs or habits are also used in medicine as part of the prognostic and diagnostic procedure. But as we learn from the Hippocratic Treatise, treatise Ancient Medicine, uh, they do not always prevent the doctor of making small mistakes. And this is passage number seven on your, on your handout. Still, signs in general, argue uh, the medical treatises, could be reliable and prevent diseases as well treat them. Epidemics, um, book um, number one, passage 23, for instance, presents a catalog um, of a Hippocratic physician's prognostic criteria. And this passage number eight on your handle. Now, such catalogs imply that disease can be recognized by examining separate features of a patient or his behavior. Uh, the epidemics divides further patients into into groups according to, among other things, their gender and age, the color and straight, straightness of their hair, the color and size of their eyes, the shape of their nose, the shape of their heads, the nature of their voice, and their pro, uh, propensity to generate breaths in the body. Later on in the third century BC, 
bodily features become the medium that could secure a certain identity. The shape of the face, the form of the, fo of the nose, the form of the eyes are included in physical descriptions of human individuals, verifying identity in documentary papyri, along with characteristics such as age, height, skin, color, the location of scars and spots. This list, however, mark a distinction between anagnosis recognition and human identification. The procedure of identifying certain physical characteristics in a medical text or documentary papyri does not offer a positive or negative ev evaluation of the person, like in the case of, an of anagnosis uh, or recognition, where signs are employed and work as uh, mnemonic devices towards the social reconstruction of identity. Now, some recognition scenes do not rely on signs and, uh, and they do not trigger any past memories, but they are still responsible for restoring relationships between family members. This type of recognition requires divine intervention and is defined by the production of wonder, trauma. Recognition stories sometimes refer to cases of people who are forced to recognize someone. Consider, for instance, the recognition scene in Book 16 between Telemachus and his father. This uh, turns out to be successful only because Athena intervenes and rejuvenates Odysseus. Telemachus is skeptical at the beginning and cannot believe that the transformed beggar is his father. Odysseus left for Troy when Telemachus was still an infant. That means Telemachus does not know how his, his father looks. Odysseus reassures him that his change in form is the work of Athena, Athena, and Telemachus believes him and accepts that he is his father. So instead of physical and or artificial signs here, Odysseus is being recognized through the trauma of transformation. But in contrast, in the recognition scene with Penelope, the miracle of the rejuvenation of Odysseus has a very specific purpose. Penelope cannot recognize Odysseus until he recovers the appearance before he left, uh, uh, before he left for Troy. He also needs to reveal bodily signs and skills, consider, remember the bow scene, as well as memories and simata signs, such as the immovable olive tree, olive tree bed that Odysseus fashioned himself and only he and Penelope alone know. However, this beautiful story of Anagnorismos, which restores Odysseus' social position, it unmasks at, unmask at the same time a fear, the fear of imposture. Since as, since as Penelope states, states, deep in my heart, and this passage nine on your handout, deep in my heart, she says, I always have had misgivings that some strange man might come and beguile me with his words. This kind of fear derives from the lack of information, uh, information on the whereabouts of a missing person, which gives rise to gossip and rumors. Up to the point that Telemachus conducts on behalf of his family, his own investigations, the information that the family receives takes the form of rumors. That is why Eumaeus thinks that he's being tricked into believing the story of Anatolian, who argues that he had seen, indeed, Odysseus among the Cretans at the house of Vitomeneus, mending his ships with storms had a shatter, and saying that he will come either by summer or by harvest, bringing much treasure along with his godlike comrades. Even though the information gathered through rumors is of dubious value and impossible to cross check, it provides relatives and friends with answers. Most importantly, they feel that they are getting the information they desperately seek. For this reason, both Eumaeus and Penelope tend to believe them. In book 19, the stranger Odysseus convinces very easily Penelope that he is speaking re reliably of having met Odysseus by describing the clothes he wore and the followers um, who accompanied him at that time. This information evokes Penelope's memory, triggers Penelope's memory, and prepares Odysseus actual return and recognition. Now, as I have already pointed out, the involvement of memory in the procedure of recognition is crucial. 
especially in recognitions of family members who are considered as missing for a long period of time. Memory indeed constitutes one of the primary means for accomplishing literary recognitions in the catalog of Aristotle in his poetics. And this passage 10 on the handout. Um, here Aristotle cites the example of Odysseus among the Phaeacians. When Odysseus hears uh, um, uh, the minstrel uh, singing, the idols singing among other things, his own story, he bursts into tears and informs the Phaeacians about his um, allegedly known for, uh, to everyone identity by just telling them his name and place of origin. But in Ithaca, however, signs and the memories he shares with his family members, as I've already uh, discussed, are the ones which helps recognizing and reestablishing Odysseus in power. The faculty of memory is being explained mainly by Plato, both in his in, in, in some treatises, but mainly in Philebus and, and Theaetetus but also by Aristotle in his um, work on memory and recollection. For Plato, memory can mean a variety of things. In Philebus, memory is a sotiria aesthetios. <clears throat> it helps retaining in the mind past perceptions. Similarly, in the Theaetetus, the discussion of the possible relations between perception and knowledge in the Vox block passage assumes the possibility of memory as preservation of perception. What is interesting here is that Socrates uses a typical recognition scene to prove the possibility of forming false opinion. And agnosis, he says, comes from comparing and matching. There, nevertheless, in this passage number 11, uh, on your handout, there is always, he says, the possibility of failure. When one puts the vision of the footprint upon the imprint um, of the other footprint, as people put a shoe on the wrong foot. Or again, one can be uh, affected as the side is affected when they use a mirror and the side as it flows makes a change from right to left and thus make a mistake. False opinion is equal, uh, is equal to misrecognition. In, uh, Aeschylus Eumenides, um, uh, we find a very interesting uh, 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 passage which describes, in a way, misrecognition and false opinion. Um, here we have Athena, and this passage number 12 on the, on the handout. We, here we have Athena. I, 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 I'm sorry, here we have Pythia describing her encounter with the um, uh, Furies. Um, she says that uh, she can't recognize what they are exactly. At the beginning, she believes that they are Gorgons, but then she cannot compare them to forms of Gorgons either. Ude out Gorkeos in a cas or two poes. She cannot compare them to forms of Gorgons either. And then she remembers that she saw some similar pictures in a painting. But at the end, she concludes that she has never saw them before in her, in her life. The fact that perception and memory could be the result of an imprinting of a perception on a um, uh, wax block worries uh, Plato. Aristotle, however, accepts in his own memory and recollection uh, the wax block idea and sex. It says that when the mind is impressed by a perception, this imprints an image upon the mind similar, similar to the way that a signet ring imprints a seal upon the sealing wax. And this passage number 13 on the handout. On this view, Penelope's memory of her husband Odysseus does not represent Odysseus per se, it represents his imprint or eidolon. This memory makes her reluctant to recognize and see the real Odysseus, and her son ch um, uh, chastises her, his, his mother for not accepting his father more readily. She should approach him and ask him questions, he complains. What is described in the Odyssey, the reluctance of uh, Penelope to uh, recognize um, her husband and 
uh, and leave uh, her memories uh, and abandon her memories. It's very close to what we see um, uh, Menelaus experiencing in Euripides' Helen. Here, Menelaus denies sight. The fact that he can see his wife, Helen, would have been enough evidence if it wasn't of the Eidolon, whose existence confuses everything. But he wishes to keep memory. And when the real Helen informs, informs him that the other is an image, image created out of air by some god, and that there are not two Helens, as he seems to believe, Menelaus decides uh, to leave her. The memory of what I went through at Troy is more convincing than you are, says in uh, at verse 593, this passage number 14 on your handout. Only when the image disappears is Menelaus ready to believe and recognize his wife. Helen, Helen is not considered missing by Menelaus since her Eidolon fills the gap of her absence in, in Troy. When this is gone, however, the memory of their marriage is what helps Helen's reintegration into their home. Remember our bridal chamber and bed, she says to her husband. But when the missing person does not return home, the memory image becomes even more real and eventually replaces the living body complete, completely. Once again, Euripides' Helen includes an interesting comment to a burial ceremony of a man who died in the sea after a shipwreck and whose body was never found. Helen Menelaus tried to escape from the Egyptian king Theoclymenus by fooling him into believing that Menelaus is a shipwrecked mariner who escaped death when Menelaus died. Theoclymenus allows Helen to bury her husband at sea and ask her at verse uh, 1214, this is passage, this is the last passage on the handout. He asked her, what, is there a tomb for the absent or will you bury, bury a shadow? He there, he says, as upon don timbos, says skian. In cases where the missing person is never found, an empty grave, a kenostaphos, secures their absence and at the same time presence through a Semma or Eidolon. But I guess this is um, a topic for a different talk and I'll uh, stop by uh, my talk here. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Maria. Um, floor is open for, uh, for discussion. Um, also people on Zoom. Um, Um, thank you very much for this uh, paper. You mentioned that this is a new project, and I can see it being massive project <laughs> and also <laughs> massively fascinating. <laughs> yes, it's very new. Yes, <laughs> um, uh, it, it is. I, I really, I really like the project, and I think we all can sort of contribute from so many directions. <laughs> yes, and uh, so I want to. I, I have many quotes and notes, and we can talk about it at time. But one of the things that I was struck with is what is at stake for someone to be recognized or not recognized, um, and also what's at stake to want to be recognized or not want to be recognized. Um, Particularly, you know, uh, and we talked about this in a different context about how when someone is not recognized, they might actually get the worst treatment from people around them. So in a sense, you know, one way in which, you know, you could frame some part of the, of the project is sort of thing like what is at stake for someone to be recognized, to want to be recognized, but in fact, not even want to be recognized, you know, because something's, something's wrong. So, you know, if, if, if that's a question, how do we bring, how do we focus all of this material around, you know, uh, the desire to be recognized or not recognized? If that makes sense. Yeah. Yes, yes. I mean, recognition, recognition is, I mean, Honneth, Honneth, he's a sociologist and Taylor as well. I mean, they talk about re recognition as, as it's, it's a political procedure. I mean, it has, it needs, it needs, um, um, uh, related to honor with Timé. So again, this is again, it's a, it's a different, 
Yes, but yes, it has to do with Timé. Now, what is Timé in antiquity? Again, it's um, a big discussion. Timé, what does the, uh, Timé means in, 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 mean in, in Homer? Has an, an, an economic aspect to main Homer. It has to do with distribution of, of, uh, of, uh, of, of goods. Uh, has to do with um, uh, benefits and rights. Um, it changes through the years. The the meaning of Timé. Uh, yes, but recognition has to do with honor. Has to do with uh, with Timé and has a political uh, dimension um, indeed. Um, if you are a missing person and you're trying to go back, you'll want to be recognized because you'll want to be, uh, um, re, um, re, uh, uh, to find a way to be reintegrated um, into your family or community. Because um, this has, uh, consequently, if you, if you, if you, if you try, if you manage to go through, uh, successfully go through the process of uh, recognition, then, you will regain political rights, uh, your property, and so on and so on. That's why it's, it's so important. Yes. So uh, if someone in Athens was ostracized, mm. is that a form of missing? Yes. You have, your, you have your political rights. You're not on the scene. Uh, people might or might not know where you are. Yeah. Uh, and they might miss you in the in our sense of desiring someone. Mm. Yes, that was, uh, was uh, the problem with uh, with Ovid as yeah. well, and the excellers. If the the figades, if we could include them, if they are, could be also considered yeah. as missing persons. Well, I will include them, or at least some cases, just to in order to differentiate between figades. Who actually yes. yes have some not a, not every political I mean some political rights. People might know where they are. I mean we know where all it is, um, but still you have this um, uh, this um, uh, feeling of missingness. I mean the the families yes. I mean yes. there is this epothal. It's, 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 it's very close to the to the story of Zalmox in the very, very close to the story of um, of disappearance when uh, missingness is a chosen status. <laughs> Uh, and it has nothing to do with the enforcer disappearing. Yeah, I mean, if you couldn't stand a certain person and they vanished from the scene, yes, I mean, you wouldn't, you wouldn't feel any lack. That, uh, they they would still technically be, I guess, missing. I mean, there are all kinds, so many different senses. Well, it depends from the perspective. Zalmox is yes, that's why in the first paragraph with this his relatives, a photo, they they yeah. they they miss him. Uh, it depends on the story. Um, other disappearance. We, I mean, we have many disappearance. Some, some, not many uh, cases of disappearance in in antiquity. Um, uh, apart from, okay, some uh, divine ones that are like the Rom Romulus one who disappear. We also yeah, have. Ganymede. Yeah. Yes, exactly. Um, there has to do with miracles and wonder. We also have. Um, uh, another case in uh, in Herodotus of um, of, um, uh, of of a general who was defeated in in a battle by Gelo and he threw himself on the sacrificial uh, fire and so he disappeared. No one could uh, could find his uh, his body uh, and 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 again there. I mean, do you see that he's he's been missed by his. Um, Relatives and countrymen. Um, this story, so this story is closer to what we see happening with uh, Zalmoxis. But yes, I think I will include at the end um, the Figada, the Excellers, just to um, um, see different cases of uh, and to talk of different cases of physical absence. Since for missingness in antiquity, it's very important. I mean, it's it's a crucial parameter. The physical uh, absence, uh, the, the the body absence, is it's a crucial parameter that defines a crucial parameter that defines an, uh, missingness. Thank you. The Zalmax's story is quite interesting because it's voluntary absence, right? I mean, mm -hmm. he chooses to disappear for whatever reason. And I wondered how how prominent that 
uh, the kind of phenomenon prominent role that plays in in your survey of the other, I mean, a voluntary uh, disappearance. And I, a jejun uh, parallel occurs to me, which um, others may recall from uh, Lord of the Rings, uh, <laughs> when uh, Bilbo decides to disappear at his uh, party, right? Um, he, he wants to get away and everybody misses him. They say, where is Bilbo? Yeah. Right. Um, why did he leave us? Uh, but they enjoy the party anyway. <laughs> um, but, but I mean, that just, it struck me that that was terrible to the So, so to what extent is this phenomenon of sort of voluntary um, uh, missingness uh, yes. part of your story? It it, it because uh, yes, it's it's a very because I mean, I talk, I mentioned briefly what happens when uh, uh, when missing persons. Um, Left when the when when the missing persons um, are considered um, and when the persons leave their home and consider missing missing they find themselves in a, in a place in a dystopia. Well, what we see happening with uh, with um, a voluntary disappearance is exactly the opposite. It's um, because there's it's um, in the Zalmox. It's a place. It's a place where wonders happen. Because there's a divine intervention, or um, it's a Zalmok's Tisa Pythagorean, and Pyth Pythagoras himself disappears. Mm -hmm. So it's 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 exactly the opposite. It's very interesting to uh, describe the two experiences, how uh, um, uh, um, 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 a, a person who voluntarily disappears finds himself in a utopia, a, a place of wonders, and tries to um, gain some recognition and honor through this experience, and how, uh, by contrast, people who, um, uh, uh, disappear, uh, who uh, disappear um, involuntary, um, um, they find themselves in dystopia, and they try to, um, to leave the place immediately and return back. Yeah, think about someone who yeah. chose to leave for ten years, chose to be missing. <laughs> so, I, might, I must say yes. I need to see. If they, do you think he's been described as um, uh, uh, by the Kenyan as a planes, as disappeared, someone who disappeared, yeah, disappeared yeah, yeah. or or as a wanderer, as someone who? Wanderer just describes going. The theorias hating. Ah, theoria, yeah. So yeah. it's not um, it's specific. Yeah. a very specific. Very yeah, specific. Yeah. But one part of that kind of gives more choice. Like theoria in general. Theory if general if a theory is a travel, theory has yeah. a very specific I mean you go for a theory, it's a very it's a, I think it's a very specific, it has a very specific purpose, right? Mm -hmm. No, I was just gonna follow up by saying that uh, in a sense, um uh, actually going missing leads to a whole met metaphorical network throughout Greek literature of being missing. And in that sense, Solon does make himself missing, and Achilles makes himself missing from um, from the Achaeans in the Iliad. You could suggest that as well. <clears throat> um, um, uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, the, speaking of voluntary, voluntarily removing he yourself. He doesn't disappear. He doesn't disappear. It's, it's about it's about absence, absence and presence. Very, it's very important. They yes. know who, where Achilles is, and they they visit him to his tent. True, but you brought up in your talk a very interestingly um, an opposition between physical being physically missing and being psychologically missing, oh. which I thought was very interesting. Mm. Uh, I thought, for example, of um, uh, in Euripides, in Bacchae, Agawe and the Minads are physically mm -hmm. present. There's a very strong set of metaphor, uh, metaphors in that play where you have, or opposition, I should say, oppositions between people who are physically present but psychologically, spiritually absent, mm -hmm. like the Minads. And then uh, later Pentheus, who is addressed as if he were present. Um, but his body is missing. Uh, he, we are of his body being um, his member, his yeah. member torn up into a thousand pieces, which are uh, not easy to find. Mm. Um, as Europeans, yes, this is a very interesting case because I think, if I remember correctly, he says right before um, he's dismembered by his mother, he says, 
uh, now um, I am without a body, a somatos, I mean, or something like, like that. So again, it has to do with bodily presence and absence. Yes. And it's connected to your other yes. big theme, recognition, which is yes, an, a different, kind of, which is a different the, kind of recognition, but still. Yes. yes, but it's interesting how these yeah. things connect. And mm -hmm. I think that and how important, how but why do you think it's important for them to have to have the uh, I mean the, the Carlos, his grandfather, he goes around and finds the members, the body members of uh, and, and he uh, and he glues them back together. To, yes. Why do you think it's important? I mean, he could have a, a kenos tapos. Um, be because because right. the whole problem of being unburied is uh, is missing. to be uh, is to remain missing, and that seems to be an intolerable fate in Greek history. Uh, and but that, that you see in them. that Hector's body is missing as long as Achilles has. And I, I know not in a strict mm. sense. But he is missing from his family in a fundamental and emotional and spiritual mm -hmm. sense until he, until he can be ritually processed, until he can be buried. And that's what a missing person is. A, one of the things I was thinking, you made me think so many things, that essentially a missing person is an unburied person. Mm -hmm. and, and, and you see that in the Odyssey as well, where Telemachus, in his ambivalence, in his uncertainty about, about his father, he keeps saying, oh, I'll, I'll find out whether I can perform burial rites or, mm. or whether I'll actually meet him. He's always yeah. says the same that together. Mm -hmm. um, so there's that uncertainty. That's what it means to be missing. And certainly about the about the yes, about the fate of, of the person uh, person missing, yes, the lack of information. Yeah. Are you going to use the case of Argamusai, where you have all the bodies that are abandoned and the Athenians absolute fury they're missing but everybody knows what happened mm -hmm. it's it's it, it, it can it can't can use everything of course but you know it's it, it, it's a very it's very interesting uh, case it's um and um but I'm very bad is yes I mean again it has to do with um with um uh, the last point I made uh, and actually, it's 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 a, it's a, it's a top four difficult. It has to do with the um, with the meaning and con the concept of kenos tafos. But I think you know, you know much more about that. That's why, That's yes, I was uh, the archaeological evidence of, about uh, kenoi tafoi. Yes, 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 okay. Is, okay. yes. Um, well, no, that was I was kind of wait. I didn't know if there was still a question on Zoom. I, I, they left. Okay. Um, when the, the very last point, can you bury a man who is missing? Yeah. We don't have Will so many first? evidence about Kenoi I must say in literature, but we do in archaeology. Yeah, but we don't have many. We, we don't have, have some. some. <laughs> yes. Um, Menecrides from Corsaira. And then there's a, there is one from Athens, uh, Democrates, I think is his name. And it's one of my favorite uh, monuments ever because it shows like uh, a young man very forlorn and crouching and like grabbing his knees above an upside down ship and we're missing the paint but I could imagine some like gnarly underwater scene um it's one of those markers. it's an underwater sea is seen potentially I mean ah. we're missing the paints you know Are these you don't very... know <laughs> we don't know what if it was intentionally shown as underwater or if he's kind of floating on the person. Mm. Um, but there's clearly an anxiety around missing person being potentially unburied. I do think that's something worth thinking about following up on, mm -hmm. which David was talking about. Yes. And I think you could also, um, I, I don't know if this is going to be part of your project, but maybe something to think about is just the way travel on the sea is a, a an anxiety producing endeavor yes. to have a family member on a boat at sea especially if it's not like high summer um the potential of something going wrong the potential of someone going missing and being eaten by fishes rather than buried then by family members who yeah. Uh, is I think really important for why we they even thought about missing people 
in general. I think David's kind of on this. Yeah. Yes, we have these wonderful poems, the Nova Gita in the in the in the Athologia Palladina, where they uh, they discuss what watery deaths yeah. and the dystopia what happens under under water and the the the, 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 the yeah. um, in the and, sea. Uh, sea. Menecrides, the cenotaph in Corsaira. Uh, I forget where he's from. He's from another poet. Polis. He's proximal, and it's either. I mean, it used to be dated late seventh, and now I, I think we all think it's sixth century BC. Um, but his brother actually travels from his home polis to Corsaira to not have a burial because the body's missing, but to just set up a tomb. I mean, yeah. there's like you would go out of your way to even perform what you could of a burial without a body. Yeah. Um, which is kind of interesting. Yes, because it's a, you need to have a semeo, you need to have a sign mm -hmm. uh, that yeah, I think it uh, is called a sema in the secures the absence, but at the same time presence yeah. of the um, yeah exactly of the body. And it's you know anyway, there's something to think about maybe. Yes, thank you very much. Who's next? Yeah, I'm going. I just want to talk to you. Maybe one one thing that. You know, it sort of connects these points um, that David and, and Tim were making. I think it would help you a lot. This is my personal opinion to move away from the issue of absence. Yeah. And to focus more on the missingness. And the reason I say this is if a trader, if a trader travels, he's absent, he's not in his community. Yes. But that can turn into missing when things start to get wrong. You know, you're kidnapped, you're dying. People say, you know, he's, me, he's not here. Oh, you know, I long for him, my husband, whatever. And then, but then you realize he was supposed to be here last week and he's not. So in, so in that sense, absence turns into, you know, missingness. And I think that that's really a, a, a moment, a perception moment, like absence can be objective. Someone is not. Yes, yes. Missingness is in a sense more, more, um, um, uh, metaphorical or perceived relative right um, um and I, to what extent do you think would help if if just because someone is absent doesn't mean they're missing and yes. someone who's absent could turn up missing because people simply don't know what's happening anymore and then other considerations happen right yes but if someone missing is still absent why do you think i i, I should not concentrate on absent because people's reactions are very different, right? If your child is at, at school, he's absent, he's not yes, here. Yes, but, but then when they stop showing up, yes. other considerations, other cultural, I understand other that. personal, yes. political yes. Uh, but stuff But if you're missing, you're still absent. It's the same thing. It's, it's not the same thing, right. but absence declines missing. Yeah, I think the point right. here is that, that there is nothing really like your absence i mean you're, you're pointing to the fact that absence in which i will all the forms that you've described it is absence but with the texture you can have absence with expectation of return right you right, can have right. absence as missing you can have absence of the theorist who is always going to come back home right right and so absence i think is crucial to okay what we're talking about yeah you can't have it without having absence, but then absence has modalities. Too. So I, I I didn't mean to like completely remove not talk about no, it, but to it's focus to yes. If you were to so focus I need to, your project, yes, to sort of really emphasize that there is a big difference between it's just a, being absent and being necessary missing. condition. Right. Yeah. yeah yes. I mean, yeah. What yeah. You can say. Yeah. Absence. Yeah. And what 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 happens once the community decides? Uh oh, someone's missing. I mean, the way the whole story of the Odyssey heard about this point, right? Because he's absent. Right. Is he missing? Um, maybe. Maybe right. he's never coming back. Right. Maybe he is, right? So, yeah. you know, that an important kind of dynamic. Yeah. Right. And I mean, the view of him during the Trojan War, was he missing? This is the yeah. thing, because it's, it's it's difficult to define time in contrast yeah. to yeah. what everybody knew experience. where it was. It's uh, difficult, yes. And the 10 years and the 20 years when when <laughs> yeah. Yeah. six months six <laughs> also funerary epigrams they help funerary epigrams yeah. yes I love yeah them. they're also very poetic mm. and, and 
culturally charged. Yeah. Good, we have a new uh, yeah. points over here. Okay. So I just um, had a question, Maria, about uh, so moving from the question of absence and missingness to the question to a question about technaria. Ah, and, yes. Um, what you call insignia. Mm -hmm. um, it occurs to me in the evidence that you shared that there's a spectrum of kinds of technaria mm. from the concrete to the abstract. Mm -hmm. On the one hand, you have what the old man suggests to be to be to be um, effective tecmeria, footprints, hair, clothing, mm -hmm. and then on the other hand, on the other extreme, the most abstract, you have stories, memories, things that are ephemeral. Yes. And, and in the middle, have, and, and, and in the middle, you have things like um, uh, the way someone the the, um, the gaze, the way the eyes move around, right? And as you said, the voice, the voice seems to me to be residing somewhere between the concrete and the abstract. At the same time, it's it's puzzling that the more, the more concrete, the, the kind of evidence of someone's identity, the, the less precise it is. So a footprint, the hair color of someone, these aren't telltales. I mean, these aren't smoking gun kinds of evidence, right? Sharing a really intimate secret is something that could perhaps guarantee someone's identity. But at the same time, those could that I mean, you you those could be falsified. So yeah. there's a weird way in which you know the, the most concrete evidence is actually the least precise. Mm -hmm. And the most precise kind of, of, of evidence, the abstract ones, you can't point to it. There's no evidentiary power okay. in court. I mean, I guess memory does have evidentiary power in memory court. Memory is a but concrete thing. I'm just thinking, Even can you talk about this? Like, how, how, are the, how are they theorizing this? Does it, are they taking ideas from medicine and and legal discourse about what constitutes good proof. Um, yes, I mean, this is... A, <laughs> what are the debates at the time? Yes, I mean, a, a abstract and concrete, I, I don't think we could do this differentiation, or at least I don't I don't think this could be productive because um, you probably think of memories are abstract, hmm? as, as abstract well, signs. I think there's something qualitatively different about memories yeah. than a footprint or a piece of clothing. I don't know what the category of difference yes. is, but it seems to me that they're not part of the same species. Yes, but still, we need to think that they're working together um, uh, in order to be recognized uh, by family members. You need to have both. You need to have the signs, which um, intrigue memory. So they, they work together. Now, about the quality and the, the strength of um, the, the concrete signs like the face and uh, I mean, if you're missing for uh, a long period of time, 20 years, of course the hair and the face ch will, will change. So these very concrete tech media lose their, um, uh, uh, their strength mm -hmm. as, as, as proof, as, as, as tech media. Um, now this is different because, because you can use technology to to do and uh, to analyze to scan yes. that's why the body is still a technician nowadays um uh, we have uh, in meds okay in, in meds we have this list with uh, signs that can help uh, the doctor choose a very specific um, uh, treatment but it's not that uh, which and, and they are part of his prognostic plan, but it's not that it's always successful. This prognostic um, uh, 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 plan, although um, uh, uh, medicine is described as acribes and as, as, as an acribe, as, 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 as a uh, very acribes techne, as a very exact uh, art, still the signs are not always uh, do not always help the physician to. Uh, uh, to treat um, a patient in the best way. 
Um, that's why I also brought into discussion um, um, uh, orators and orator speech and how they manipulate science. So science is something actually not very concrete. Bodily science, it happens. Mm -hmm. It's something that can be manipulated. Mm -hmm. Yes, later on, probably under the influence of physiognomy, yeah. uh, these changes, uh, and we do have, um, for instance, in the documentary papyri, signs there are indeed used in order to identify a specific person. But I don't think, I think there is a difference between identification and recognition. A recognition has to do with um, um, a moral evaluation of, of, of a person. I, I rec identify, I recognize someone that means, that's why memory is so important, that, that means uh, I can say, I can see, I can say that this person is, is good or bad. Whereas um, um, identification is just, um, uh, this person is Ken. Um, at least this is what we see from the documentary papyrus. So you're a clay, uh... Ident identifies Odysseus and recognize or recognize. recognize. So the scar is enough to give the the moral idea. No, the scar is not enough to give the but moral idea. That's why the we person. have the memory. I see, the scar um uh, it's, uh, it's 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 um, it's the sign that intrigues your memory. So Maria, could could you say that signs, so physical signs, help identify the person in a kind of descriptive, neutral sense? And memories tell you that the person is still the person he once was before he yes. left 10 years ago yes. and that yes. he shares yes. it. Exactly. Not in the yes. same. So there's a kind of moral valence. Yes. Memory isn't the same as signs, though, because the signs are the thing that you have and don't you have. No, no, but they walk That's together. Same, but you can so. share stories. Like they, will, they walk together, memories and stuff. Yeah. But no, just the It's a lot of But just one. It struck me in your passage 10 when memory comes up with Aristotle, which mm -hmm. is poetic. It's interesting that um, one who's remembering there is Odysseus, right? Hmm? Um, yeah, Odysseus, yes, in the patients. He's the one who's he's the one remembering. remembering. It's not the audience who is remembering him, right? Yes. So the memory there is not something that's used. Um, as it were, it's not in the audience. No. He's trying to rec to recognize. Yes, yeah, because for him, I mean, it's that's why I actually I I didn't use Aristotle a lot because I think he would have been very confusing to you because he talks about <laughs> recognition. No, no, he talks about recognitions, literary recognitions in literary, and he uh, and he evaluates um, uh, the technicity of these recognitions. Yeah. And he says, well, here we do have a recognition. For him, it's an agnorismos. It's uh, the, the, the fact that uh, Odysseus reveals his, reveals his identity by simply saying his name and uh, uh, where he comes from. Um, it's an agnorismos, a very simple one, according to, to, uh, uh, to Aristotle. But yes, I mean, with the help of, with the, with the help of, help of memory. I mean, the, the type of anagnosis that I, I, I try to present, which collaborates, it's, or at least it's the result of a collaboration between signs and memories, it's, com it's a completely different one. But, but with the patients, you have the reinforcement of the grief. In the that is, when, when Odysseus hears the, the story of his mm -hmm. deeds at Troy, he weeps. And, yeah. and so that, I mean, anybody could say, oh, I'm Odysseus. But only perhaps the real Odysseus would 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 react but that, you, with that emotion. You, you be, you but you can, could dissimulate tears. Yeah, yeah, and he but he could be just an, uh, just a, a warrior who fought in Troy and he remembered his time right. in Troy. Why specifically Odysseus? Yeah. Or are we talking about? Um, uh, yes, no. I think Maria wanted to ask. Okay. Ah, Rachel. <coughs> Um, is this a new point? This is following up on Penny's, um, yeah. or maybe rephrasing Penny's a little bit. So this is a society that generally sees visual evidence as extremely important, right? Autopsy is the key in historiography. Mm -hmm. Whereas here, what's 
kind of striking and unusual is that it's not the visual evidence that is the, the spragus, it's the story. Which it's is a combination. It, well, it's a combination, yeah. but the key is the story. The key is the story. Because uh, you cannot trust signs. Right, and that's very unusual. It's not very unusual. Well, I mean, you, you, we, we see that in 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 in, in the oratory, in the oratory, in oratory speeches, uh, well, taking least... advantage of signs and Pygmalion and manipulating the proofs and um, in tragedy as well. Um, and but if you're coming from historiography, in Herodotus as well, story. it's out of in Herodotus uh, something that we um, the Pygmalia uh, of Herodotus something that we. Uh, Marion is the thing in Thucydides, but he's very emphatic that when somebody tells you something, you can't really believe it. You need evidence and often visual evidence. Yes, this is what Thucydides says. Yeah, Everyone does <laughs> Her say in book one, it's very early. He says people tend to trust what they see rather than their ears. Yeah, perfect. Your point of, of combination. The practice of documasia, I think, is fascinating, mm -hmm. and that can really help. Like when the, when Athenians wanted to put someone for high office and they would be lost, yeah. they also go through a testing of citizenship. Yeah, documasia to see if they're if they're the real people. Mm -hmm. oh. And one way they would do it because because you know it was penalty of death to impersonate the citizen. And what they did, and interestingly enough, we don't really have evidence of anyone actually succumbing to documasia to actually be put to death. Uh, through that process. But what they did was they asked the people they knew mm -hmm. and the family, yeah. uh, but they also went and checked the records of the properties where they presumably would actually have written records of births and someone being the son of someone and so on and so forth. So that's a combination yes. of <clears throat> the collective that is not just identifying, but then recognizing as a citizen with a moral capability mm. and a intellectual capability, some would say even mm. biological uh, ability to be a, an elected citizen. It's the same with the proxeno. Yeah. It's, it's, it's both. Yeah. It's, uh, yes, proofs, tech medias, uh, yeah. uh, come from sight and seeing, and also hearsay and rumors and the stories around these people. Yeah. Uh, it's, a, it's a combination. You need both in order to identify it. Also, as a side note to that, yeah, you must, yeah I think that is an interesting. Yeah, it's a very interesting. Um, but they would also sometimes visit the family plot as well. For me? The family plot, oh. burial mm -hmm. plot, to mm -hmm. so see names on inscriptions and things like that. Mm -hmm. So there's also, I mean, just tying these threads together. Um, it's, cool. yeah. Yeah, thank you. Uh, just to conclude, maybe the point about the signs, I, I would just point out that in the medical literature, period, there's a great emphasis on the need to look at multiple signs in combination. So it's not that any one itself mm -hmm. is decisive, but you have to look at the whole picture. So this list that you gave in passage eight, yes, of all the epidemics, yes, it's kind of a um, you know, a, a list of everything that you're supposed to be looking at, mm -hmm. and somehow assess the strengths of each one of these indications and come up with some comparative um, overall assessment. So that is definitely part of the ideology of medicine at that time. You can see that in the prognostic yeah. uh, treatise yeah, uh, yeah. says that. So mm -hmm. anyway, there is this notion of weighing the signs against one another. Mm -hmm. um, there isn't any sort of smoking gun individual sign that sort of clinches um, prognosis or diagnosis. And it's very interesting because when you start is when he comments on the passage of the scar on the on the nitra on the bath and the, that scenes he says well we cannot accept he also um, uh, uh, like Porfiry Porfiry he uh, mentions Aristotle uh, and saying that Aristotle challenged this particular scenes scene because uh, and and he says well it's not just the scar it's a combination of signs it's the demo the voice the age everything that uh, 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 trigger uh, memory and and we have the anagrams of the recognition. I think I'm uh, Yeah, no, please. Yeah. Okay. No, 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 no,
no, I, I I just go back to this state of missingness, and uh, how uh, the missingness ends. I mean, where is the, this this being the point where uh, the meaning the missingness if there is if there is war well, there is no return come back from the person and uh, the family or uh, the family uh, say that now this person is missed and we consider it as a dead man a dead person or yeah. what's the state of uh, yes that's why it will be very easy if we had legal texts actually talking about this yeah. <laughs> brilliant we do have some roman text later um it, it, because it has to do with time it, it, it does no it's, it does not depend on time uh, it's very difficult to the de to define missingness um, in um, I mean in in uh, um, uh, to define the period of missingness and when this period ends. Um, however, by contrast, in the Egyptian law or in the Babylonian law, we do have find references saying that well, after seven years or after after ten years, the wife uh, she's allowed to. Uh, and find another, another man and remarry. Um, there is something um, men, um, in the Roman law um, uh, trying to um, uh, discuss what happens when soldiers uh, do not return, when, what happens when soldiers don't return uh, from where war. And and uh, I don't remember right now. I don't remember the time period. I think it's five years. And they said then again, um, the wife um, uh, she's allowed to to find someone else, and um, and her guardian um, uh, could uh, take care of her uh, of her property. As I said, we don't have um, uh, yes, probably because as we said, Greeks are obsessed. With the body and with the with the burial customs, we need to find the body and bury the body. Yeah, perhaps has something to do with that. That's why we don't find something in in laws. We don't laws do not define missingness, although it's a very important thing. Who who takes care of the of the property? Who takes care of the field? And of course, the the, the wife. It's very they strange that they don't. Huh? Or the um the curious for the wife. Exactly, the curious. Oh, um, I just want to say I, I, um, uh, I really enjoy this, and I think this idea of uh, the connection between missingness and death uh, and cenotaphs it seems to be quite a productive one. This idea that missingness is always to be on the edge of death mm -hmm. because that's obviously ordinarily, obviously, he's even in the under. Yeah, get that far. <laughs> he wish he'd go yeah. that close. <laughs> oh, really, that's the yeah. But you can fit it into lots of other things, like obviously the, the novels where you have some people who willingly go as an Achilles Tatius, and the lovers willingly um, uh, skip town, whereas in um, uh, Caritone's um, Caliroa, she's dead. She's she, they the think tomb. she's dead in the, in the tomb, tomb. Yeah. and then she she's broken out of the tomb mm -hmm. and then has some travels. Mm -hmm. Again, modeled on the sort of yeah. Odyssey and uh, uh, travels. Um, and of course, you didn't mention the most famous missing person in antiquity, Jesus. <laughs> he's in, he's buried, and then he leaves, it becomes a cenotaph, yeah. and then he goes off. Mm. Mm. You know, he's in classical antiquity. So. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> he's, he's missing, we're still waiting. Mark, for him. Mark. <laughs> But yeah, I think it's a very productive uh, idea. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, sorry. And a few. So I had a, a question. Um, uh, I'll try and articulate it. I, I'm interested in what happens to this logic of recognition that you are laying out uh, specifically through memory. Because memory seems to, as I understand your, your presentation, memory seems to be sort of integral providing the regulated function for um for missing for us to be able to understand what it means to be missing yeah and i'm interested in i i don't know it seems to me like a, a sort of acute mode of missing in in this notion of madness that you refer to in yeah. relation to sapo 16. and i think that this 
comes to the fore when all you have is memory and nothing else. Uh, when, when, and that's where you ended your presentation saying yeah. that, you know, that's probably another talk. So that may be what I'm asking about. It's if you don't have the return of the missing and then all that you have is memory, then I wonder whether the sort of logical recognition sort of risks a kind of inversion. And we see that in Sappho 16 and so far as you have Helen who's, who's sort of presented as this kind of paradigmatic case and you're reading her as missing, which is, which is interesting. Yeah. Um, but then I guess- She's I'm, missing there. Because Helen, she, she's missing there. Depends on the story. Presented okay. as this kind of voluntary act of missing. Yeah. But then, what's interesting to me is how who you read to be the counterpart to Helen in Sappho sixteen. Is it is it Anatolia? Anatolia. Or, so I I read it yeah. more to be Sappho, or, uh -huh. or because like Helen, who pursues what she desires at the expense of her sort of established identity at home, mm. gives up yeah. that identity. You have Sappho who pursues in memory Anatolia. And the what I find interesting there is that if you see that in terms of the sort of larger mode of madness, yeah. then the memory becomes <clears throat> to the extent that you 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 protect the identity uh, of the person that you miss, in this case Anatolia, it requires a certain dissolution or renunciation of your identity in the way that Helen renounces her identity. And then you get that sense, I think, in Sappho 16, but with Sappho saying that irrespective of the norms of what I'm expected to, to, to value, I give up all of that in the way that Helen gives up her parents, her husband, her children. Yes. So I'm, I'm wondering whether when the memory is all that there is, whether then that leads to some kind of uh, acute form of missingness, whether even the person who does the missing sort of gets taken up in that memory and must renounce, you know, uh, the, the sort of normal, normative markers of their Yes, identity. yes. I mean, this is the thing, when, when, when the person never returns and the memory takes over, the memory image, the eidolon, that's why I think uh, Helen is so important as a text in this discussion. The eidolon takes over just the memory. And that's why Penelope, she, she's reluctant. She doesn't want to recognize this person who stands in front of her. He's old, he's, he's not Odysseus, he's... <laughs> that's, why, that's why Athena rejuvenates him. And it, 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 it's very difficult to... And that's why Menelo says, I will stay with that memory. I, who are you? <laughs> I prefer to stay with my memories in Troy. I want these, the Eidolon, not the, the real thing. Because, probably, because the memories, it's 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 prettier I and mean, it's 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 a it's an ideal version of the person in a way. Is is that what you were? It's the way in this this it's the way you experience. Um, and that would be a form of madness. Is that were you referring to that as madness when you were? No, no. I mean, I, I refer to madness because madness is the cause behind um, Helen's okay. missingness. So madness is just as it's it's the cause, uh, but I see your point. Yes, I, I and I, and I think it's very interesting. But yes, um, how how Sappho uh, takes the role of Helen and takes the place of Helen, and how she's the actually she she's she's yes she identifies herself um, uh, uh, with Helen. I think this, this is very interesting. Thank you. I just have one last um, thing to say that's been on my mind at the time. Yeah. Um, because you speak about the fear of imposture and you're talking about identity and you're making me think all the time about what exactly a person is. Um, just going back to what Kenny said about different kinds of signs, physical and non material. And um, it's not really clear what a person is. Um, we're, we're not really coterminous with our bodies in, in Greek literature. Yeah. So, um, so, but but the body does have this essential place. And Achilles, we meet in the, in the Iliad, 
um, says he hates men more than he hates the gates of hell uh, who are not what they seem, who in a sense are, yeah, they're not the same as their body. They, they were hiding their minds. And then we meet him again in the Odyssey, we meet his, his specter, his Avalon, saying how he wished more than anything that he could be a body again, and he'd even be a he'd even be a slave if he could be alive. Doesn't he say, "I would will, will love to have a body again, Soma"? What, well, that's what, what he's saying. He's saying, "I, I, I, I'd even be a serf, the lowest of the low, if I could be embodied." Isn't he saying that? I don't, I don't remember. Or does he say that I would love to be, I would, I would like to be alive? I mean, what is that? I'd rather be a serf than the than to be the lord of the dead. Yes, that's what that's yes, what he said. Yeah. Rather than be the lord of the dead, that's the comparison. Yeah, yeah. He'd be the lowest of the lowest. And I think one of and I'm just saying that to bring it to the point about that I was thinking about slavery uh, in antiquity <laughs> and what a person is, because um you you seem to be making the strong point that a person is a person's body. And 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 I think you repeat you bring up Euripides well about this because of the uncertainty of science and how the science left by bodies can be misread or they can be manipulated just like in rhetoric. Um, so a, a body is unique, although it can be dissembled. And we see that in the theatre of Dionysus, where we have these fake bodies, these impostures, people mm. wearing masks, people being persons that that they are not. A mask. Uh, are masks a uh, mask in fifth century theater to mask in fifth, fifth century theater present represent unique features? Well, they represent certain persons, not the person who is underneath. They they're an invent, they're a fiction, or just abstract uh, using some general um, signs to say. I mean, okay, I see that. I can recognize that the person wearing these masks is Dionysos or hell. Yes. So it's a specific you, you just, person from yeah, general. Uh, they don't they don't uh, represent. I mean, specific features, eyes, and you cannot recognize. Yes. You, are you are you suggesting that it works together with with language? Yeah. Uh, this is okay. Helen. Yeah. I am Helen. Yeah. I'm Yes. Yeah. Yeah. That's true. Um, but the, <laughs> that all works together to make a unique but fictional person. Yeah. And a virtual creation, uh, not a real creation, not coterminous with any body, <laughs> with any physical body. Mm. Um, but the reason I bring up slaves is because, again, just to go back to the idea of anxiety, um, an anxiety in Greek literature for, for women, say in, in Homer, yeah. is to be sold into slavery yeah. and to become, um, I'm going to suggest not unique any longer, um, but fungible, tradable, yeah. like money is tradable and you don't hang on to a specific coin, uh, you, you use it to stand for something else. And so um, you, 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 you lose something of your uniqueness when you become a slave. Yes. Um, and I wonder if there's a kind of anxiety about um, being a slave and you losing this uniqueness. Well, about in, in Greek poetry, the understand it, it seems to be understood that identity or personhood is not something you can hold on to. Mm. It's um, it's a fiction that we all have to buy into, like money, yes. for it to to work. And um, I, I'm not sure exactly what I'm getting at. Well, but... about slaves and uh, not having a they actually have they have tattoos. Yes. Saying I am the slave of these, so they had a very specific identity. Everyone would have that. Huh? They all, all had a tattoo saying that. Yeah. Well, one, maybe uh, one last thing to kind of yeah. follow up on that point too. Um, medics in Athens uh, had to register with a prostates, like you know, someone who was standing for them. And if at any point in time a citizen accused that person of either impersonating someone trying to remain anonymous and unregistered the charge the the penalty was enslavement mm, oh. so like to attempt to be anonymous would result in enslavement okay so like exactly. you are either a person who is a mm -hmm. a free person and living here legally a citizen or if you're in any other category you could be sold into slavery so the attempt to be anonymous would be 
so to, to someone to, else. But. I mean, if oh, you sure. if you re refuse to register at, with a prostatase and therefore just kind of try to blend in, <laughs> um, someone could call you out. And right. the slave is also present in Athens, but might be missing at home. Exactly. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Slaves are, many slaves are missing people. Yeah, yes, exactly, exactly. That's exactly. uh, so a really cool point. That's what I'm thinking. Anyway. Right. Well, maybe that's a good note to uh, okay. thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I thank you. I one more thing because um, if you see, it might be for did you know that um, the autobiography of uh, yes. Aaron Dobbs is called Missing Person? Right? <laughs> <laughs> Does that, uh, have you read that? I, mean, I did, yeah. I mean, he, he's also in a journey trying to find his own identity. Thanks, everybody.